Welcome to the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. I'm Dr. Steve Wood. And when we talked about going on a summer break, you know, we had mentioned that we'd pop back in time to time, let's talk about special topics. And this one, we couldn't just leave alone. This, I'm, I'm referring to the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. I know a lot of people had been asking our opinions on what we thought uh, about certain issues. So I figured, why not come on and have a conversation? And joining me today is Sean Murphy. Sean's been a, you know, a regular on the podcast before. He heads our wing of critical communications at Courtroom Sciences. So I'm going to pick his brain a little bit, too, about the narrative and social media and that. So, Sean, thanks for joining the podcast with me today. Thank you, Steve. Happy to be here. You know, and there's, I think before we actually start, too, I, I want to lay a disclaimer out that, you know, Sean and I, we're not going to, not attempting to pick a side and, you know, be pro Johnny or pro Amber. I think really what today we want to do is kind of look at it from just a really objective point of view and look at things from, like I said, a legal psych critical communication standpoint versus trying to pick a side. So I just want to throw that out there for all of our listeners to understand. But, you know, Sean, there's so much to unpack with this trial. So where do you want to start? You know, we had a conversation, but, you know, where, where, do you, where do you think to start here as far as unpacking this from a critical communication standpoint? <clears throat> sure. I think that the, um, you know, it's very interesting that uh, there's always this moment in any kind of crisis or litigation situation where you, uh, it's, it's, it, you know, it's, it's a critical point where someone is going to define or control the narrative. And uh, that's really what, kind of what happened here. As you see, just talking about, you know, the court of public opinion, not what occurred, you know, with the jury and with the courtroom, that's your space, but talking about how public opinion was being influenced and what narrative was being communicated, you know, that kind of happened very early on. Um, the trial just really by virtue of the, uh, Depth side having the opportunity to go first. And so what we saw is that um, in the early testimony of, of people, they began to really kind of define the narrative and to define her. And so in really good litigation communications, the job is to try to not let that happen. You know, they don't have control over the trial schedule, but they know who's going to testify, generally speaking. They know, uh, generally speaking, what their testimony is going to be. So every day you kind of have to fight at minimum for a tie or to change the headline. And that seemed to be one of the opportunities missed in the, at least the first days of that uh, trial for Amber. You know, I think that's important that you say, it's funny that you say that is because, you know, I just saw Amber just did a recent interview with Savannah Guthrie. And one of the things she made it a point to say is that she felt like you know, Johnny Depp's team had done a better job of distracting jurors and other individuals from the actual issues at hand. And I think really that goes to what you're talking about, right, about initially starting that narrative early on and having it kind of run its course throughout the trial. That's true. And, you know, I was surprised because, uh, you know, uh, what we heard is that she had, she was represented by a communications firm, certainly her lawyers, uh, and so what we didn't really see from that side, at least in the early days, is an apparent strategy. So for example, one of the earliest witnesses to testify was a forensic psychologist, and she made a you know, very bold statement that Amber suffers uh, from borderline personality disorder. And if you remember, that was like one of the early headlines. It was a very big headline. It was a story that you know, got posted a lot uh, on social media and you know, kind of began to define her. So in classic litigation communications, you want to rebut that, that day with your own experts. You wanna put people, make people available who can say, well, we have a different point of view on that, and here's why. So what you're really fighting for there is a tie in the headline. One psychologist said this, the other psychologist said that. Um, alternatively, the option is to change the headline to have something that's more compelling, another story that you can put out maybe exclusively with you know, one particular uh, media outlet that can also have legs with um, social media. So this is something you have to do every day though. And you can plan it somewhat in advance because as I said, you know who the witnesses are gonna be, you know generally what they're going to say. How do you rebut them? You can't wait 
until it's your turn on the stand to rebut them because then a week has passed and the narrative is already gelled and it's pretty, pretty solid. Hard to change at that point. You know, and, and when, you, like I said, I asked you before and I kind of knew the answer and, and you confirmed it for me, but, you know, I wanted to know whether or not you think Johnny had his own PR firm because a lot of the things that he was doing, it seemed very subtle and it seemed like he was gaining a lot of traction. And I was just curious, do you think that he had some, you know, you know, things going on in the background in order to develop these and do the things that you're saying that maybe Amberside should have done? Well, the, the answer is I don't know for, for certain, but when we look at these kinds of campaigns, the best ones look like they're organic. And, you know, going into this, and she, I think, has acknowledged this in some of her follow-up interviews, uh, he had a larger fan base. He has a very passionate fan base. So, you know, there was a group there to, uh, you know, to kind of ride with. So he didn't really have to do a lot of work to, his team did not have to do a lot of work to, you know, find people who were empathetic to his position, right? And so what was kind of smart was the, was the cadence of the witnesses and the trial in terms of the public positioning because they were able to come out with, you know, somewhat compelling headlines every day. And that, and it all fed into a singular narrative. So um, whether he did or didn't, I don't know, but it would, you know, it appeared to be a, a sophisticated uh, um, uh, way of operating. And it, and obviously, you know, I think people would say just, a, just a, any look at the social media coverage and the narrative that was communicated that it, you know that, that that's exactly what happened yeah i think one of the other things you know you had little catchy slogans like justice for johnny and then after when you know about the the fecal matter and stuff she all of a sudden then became right amber turd uh and i saw things you know saturday night live did a whole skit about it and a whole sketch about it so i think once again whether that happened organically or whether that happened through kind of the social media storm it allowed him to ha have a good narrative because, like you said, justice for Johnny and then this other negative connotation towards Amber doesn't necessarily help engender, you know, people towards you. Oh, well, it's true. And, you know, unfortunately, that's the, the very dark side of, the, of social media where, you know, the, the haters, the people are going to jump on and uh, take it in a whole different direction. It's very unfortunate, but it's something that you have to be aware of and you have to be prepared to manage if you're going to be in one of these high profile situations. You know, and it was interesting too, is my son's 11 and he comes up to me afterwards and say, did you hear Johnny won the trial? And I, and I said, you know, like, you know, you're 11. Who, how do you even know who Johnny Depp is? I mean, what movies have you seen of his? You know, and he, you know, you mentioned Pirates of the Caribbean, but he hadn't seen anything else, right? He didn't come up with, with, with Johnny Depp like you and I did. So we had a little bit more experience with him. And I said, well, why were you like pro Johnny? And he goes, well, I thought Johnny had a better case. And I said, better case? Like you haven't been watching the case. How do you, how do you know Johnny had a better case? Where have you seen this at? And I, and I knew kind of the answer before I even asked it. And sure enough, he said, well, I've seen videos on TikTok. And I said, so the videos on TikTok showed you what Johnny's case was and how strong Johnny's case was. And he said, yeah, but the truth of the matter is, he couldn't really, when I asked him further questions, he really couldn't explain why or what he understood. He was literally just going off of the snippets and the you know real 30 second sound bites that he was seeing on TikTok. Sure, and a lot of that was the sensationalized uh, aspects of their personal lives and their, and their marriage. So uh, having very little to do with the essence of the case. Uh, so that's the, that's the unfortunate thing. That is why you have to really be careful to manage the narrative and your messaging in a situation like this because it's left to impressions, right? It's left to a 30 second soundbite and, and you can make a decision off of that. And that's how people are, you know, kind of conditioned these days. Uh, you have to sit in that courtroom every day and hear the legal arguments in order to make a statement like that, or you should, you should think you should. Uh, but, you know, the way you can position one person and their narrative and deposition another and their narrative uh, is really, you know, part of the game now that social media is so prominent in shaping people's opinions, which is interesting because, you know, it's not really about, if you think a lot about social media, it's not about changing minds. It's really about finding people who already will tend to believe what it is that you're putting out there. And it's kind of organizing your army, right? Uh, so you can't do a lot of influencing in 30 seconds. You have to 
basically finding people who are already preconditioned or uh, to, to side with you, who, who, who believe as you believe. And so when you're doing that kind of planning, especially in litigation communications, and you are dealing with a highly emotional issue, you have to play on that plane too. And again, yeah. sometimes you just play for a tie. Can't always win, but it would be better to try to neutralize that kind of an argument, but you have to have the discipline to do it every day. And I think you're talking too about being able to, to neutralize it is if you look at, you know, going back to the social media, if you look, it just seemed like it was a lot of pro Johnny, but you know, it might not have been that there was that many people out there that were supporting him. It was just that they were more of the vocal majority. And I think one of the other things we saw, you know, from a social proof standpoint, we've talked about social proof on the podcast before, right? Where you're looking around and you get a sense for kind of what people are doing to give you a sense for how you should be behaving. And I think you either were a supporter of Johnny, saw that everybody was being very vocal and, and started vocalizing yourself, or you were a supporter of Amber and you were seeing what was going on to those people who were supporters of Amber. Because from what I saw, a lot of that stuff was really, really negative. If you came out in support of Amber, you were just getting eviscerated by other individuals. So if I'm someone who wants to support Amber, I say, I'm not stepping my toe in that ring because I can see what's happening to other people. So I'm better off to just keep my mouth shut. But then when you think about it though, then what ends up happening is now all of a sudden, all you see is pro Johnny all the time, but it's not. And so you think everybody's in support of him. And the truth of the matter is maybe there's other people who actually support Amber. They just aren't the vocal majority. Yeah, I mean, the, the, and that's the trick of it. And it's also the shame of it because you really kind of, you have to give them uh, cover in supporting you, your supporters. You have to give them cover. And cover comes in the form of, you know, how strong your messaging and what kind of evidence you're presenting. And are you meeting the moment and saying, well, they're saying this, but let me give you another point of view here. So you have to give them ammunition so that they can fight back. Um, and also, you're right. I mean, it's about the algorithm. So it's about, you know, when the, when the narrative takes over, it's hard to see what pops, you know, it's hard to change what pops up first. And because of the strength of his numbers and because of the way that uh, the arguments and the narrative was fed, you know, that's the one that's gonna come up first everywhere because that's where the algorithm is going to lead. Uh, so if you're, you know, if you're losing that battle, then you're, you're, also, you're also losing the prominent positioning on social media. It's hard to, it is hard to turn that tide. There, have, there would have to be a, seminal moment in the course of the trial that would have changed everything. And of course, there was nothing, at least from the public standpoint, that, that did that. You know, and you talk about a, a seminal moment, and I think it kind of got glossed over, but I, I thought it was interesting from a reptile theory perspective, which we talk about on the podcast a lot as well, is, you know, in closing, I can, uh, I'll even read it here, right? They, you know, they had gone up on, uh, they had gone to the judge to lodge an objection about this that was said, because it's almost kind of like reptile theory, not necessarily quite like what ends up happening in personal injury cases, but I thought it was interesting because it does use some of the similar tenets. Uh, but what the, the, the what this was, was about, you know, is, is whether or not they the jury found against uh, Amber and in favor of Johnny Depp. They said, ruling against Amber here sends a message that no matter what you do as an abuse victim, you always have to do more. No matter what you document, you always have to document more. No matter whom you tell, you always have to tell more people. No matter how honest you are about your own perfection, imperfections and your own shortcomings in a relationship, you have to be perfect in order for people to believe you. Don't send that message. That's what, and it says, Depp here wants you to send. So I think that was interesting about, you know, going back to the reptile theory about send a message to companies to do better. Send a message that if you harm one of our individuals, you know, you're going to have to pay. But I think this one was interesting as well, that they were kind of using it to say, uh, a finding in favor of Johnny Depp is actually sending a message to abuse victims or survivors that, you know, we don't hear you, we don't see you. And I think it, I thought that was an interesting uh, approach as well by, by counsel. Yeah, I think it was too. It, it, it was, um, you know, and, and therein lies a group of supporters that already exist who feel very strongly about that uh, issue online and elsewhere, right? So you would hope, see, that is, that is something that should have been introduced or could have been introduced, I should say, uh, much earlier in the, in the trial and the argumentation. And you know, that is a narrative that if you're going to 
kind of rest your case on that, then you need to start feeding that from day one. You need to support that narrative from day one. And that's what would organize and, and give cover to the people who would support that point of view. It's, you're right, it, it's, it, it, it's making the issue bigger than the, pe than the people involved in the case. It's making the issue bigger than the, um, you know, kind of like the, the, the tales of their marriage and their lives together. Um, <clears throat> just something much more important. And, but you can't just kind of put that out there, at least from the public, court of public opinion perspective, you know, much later on, you have to really say, if that's your message, then tell me every day um, why this is so and make it a part of your case. Give me witnesses, give me experts, give me people who can say, who can support and expand on that point. And, and then I think you have a chance of kind of balancing uh, the appeal of the narrative and also the star power of the two people involved here, uh, because you're talking about something much bigger. Right. And I think what was interesting is I just kind of stumbled upon it too. It wasn't like I, it was really something that was, that would made a lot of headlines. You know, I had to, I had to search. And like you said, it was one of more of those back of the page type things versus being out in front. I mean, like I said, it only came up as an issue because the, the headline that I saw was that Johnny Depp's team was objecting to it and was sending it to the, the judge to make a ruling on, but he, she, she had said she wasn't going to rule on it, but that's really how it came up versus to your point being front and center about kind of weaving that through because reptile theory attorneys will do that in personal injury cases all the time, right? They'll start the case at the very beginning in openings and weave that theme throughout so that people will feel more empowered and compelled when it gets to the end. And I think this was another one of those things that could have been, could have been used to their advantage, which I think was interesting to see that, I, you know, just how it kind of played out uh, in this trial. Yeah. I mean, it would have helped, uh... It would have helped to uh, deal with and uh, kind of somewhat neutralize, you know, the, kind of the stories that are coming out about their their marriage and what happened between them, and make that a much smaller thing. If you if you make it about a bigger issue, if you make it about something that affects other people who, and they can identify with it uh, in their lives, then you know therein lies the opportunity to control the narrative. You know. Um, it was interesting because towards the final, well, I would just say this, that, you know, um, I think that the messaging along that line, you know, if you want to uh, kind of help support that message that this is about a bigger thing, then you, you would have, you would have um, probably made a case, for example, that, uh, you know, this trial is just another example of abuse, right? Because we're rehashing very private details and it's humiliating, right? And so, um, if you have a that broader theme that you're settled on that you think is you know, that, that makes it an issue for other people, then there are other ways to argue that in the court of public opinion. Yeah, and I think you know I know you, you don't work with witnesses, you know, and, and that's not really your area. But I am curious, you know, to talk about this a little bit. But I want to talk about kind of the testimony of of each individual, and I think that's where we also saw a difference in opinions about how people viewed it. So, you know, to, to, to start with, with Amber, one of the big things that came up was the fact that everybody, you know, thought she was fake crying or she just didn't seem genuine while she was on the stand. And I think that probably came and, and hurt her credibility in the eyes of the jurors and in the public because it just seemed disingenuous and probably didn't help the fact that she's an actress. So then people already are thinking, Hey, She's, she's an actress, she can cry on command. So I wanna see whether or not she's being genuine. And I think some of the things she did, you know, belied that genuineness. And I think it, it kind of impacted her as far as perceived uh, credibility. You know, and I think one of the other things too, you and I had talked about this kind of looking at the jury too much. You know, when we, a lot of times when we talk with witnesses, we talk to them about, you know, how the, the answer is not necessarily for the attorney, it's for the jury. But there's going to be times that you want to just look at the attorney and then there's going to be times you want to turn to the jury because if not, it looks like a ping pong match, right? Because you're answering questions and looking and looking. And I think she kind of hurt herself in that because every time she wanted to answer, she could she just always turned and looked right at the jury. And I think it got to a point where it was almost overdone um, because it was like she was trying to convince them versus trying to meet them where they are, get them to understand and find her credible. and 
you know, believable, but it almost seemed forced too much. So I think there's a, there's that line where you can go too far and look at the jury too much. Cause then, like you said, it seems disingenuous. It seems like you're trying to pull the wool over their eyes. And frankly, from, I heard from other individuals and I'm not sure how you feel. I'd be curious on what your thoughts are is it was creepy. I mean, I heard that some people just were weirded out by the fact that she kept looking at the jury all the time. Yeah, no, I didn't. Uh, my thought was that, um, you know, you have to understand and know that your testimony on a broadcast trial is going to be uh, cut and sliced and, you know, rebroadcast as snippets and clips. And so you have to be certain that, you know, you, you can survive that editing uh, in terms of your demeanor, in terms of how you present yourself and your own credibility. So, you know, I didn't really catch that particular thing, but I would just say that, you know, in today's age, on a trial that's being broadcast, um, uh, know that, you know, you're going to be edited and replayed. And so uh, you kind of have to think and prepare your testimony with that awareness, which again is unfortunate because the decision should be made within that courtroom, but everyone, including uh, an 11-year-old, is going to have an opinion about this because of a video they saw of you testifying, which may may just have been like, a, that might have been maybe just your bad 30 seconds, right? Or 10 seconds. But that is a tough image to erase. So that's the unfortunate thing. Um, yeah. And she also, and she also at one point, she had an amygdala hijack, as we'd say, right? I mean, there was several times where she allowed, you know, and I think it was interesting, and we can talk about that more too, is I think it was interesting about how things played out in the courtroom as far as the attorneys objecting and the attorneys really going in on the witnesses. And it was almost like I could hear people were saying they were tuning in to see that back and forth, that combativeness. And there were several times where Amber lost her cool and got flustered and got frustrated. And once again, that made your 30 second snippet. And I think that's why people were wanting to tune in. The problem is in a real trial, you wouldn't want your attorney or you wouldn't want your witnesses doing that on the stand, right? You wouldn't want your witnesses losing their cool and becoming flustered or being snarky or firing back comments. But it was strange that in this setting, it was kind of like a circus of sorts that people wanted that and enjoyed that. And, and that's what they were tuning in for. But and like I said, in a real trial, that's absolutely not what you would want your witnesses to do, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think, and then to flip to Johnny, obviously, Johnny Depp had, he'd had some good moments, but he also had some bad. I think one of the big things that people had asked about whether or not I was watching it, and I could only do a couple of days worth of Johnny Depp's testimony because I found his responses to be very, very long-winded, you know, and it got to a point where, some of the times the, the attorneys would object for being non-responsive or they had made several comments about, you know, Mr. Depp, you had your time to give long-winded responses. And I think some of the times that hurt him because the more he talked, it was almost like, what was the question again? What, what are we even talking about here? And then before you know it, he's, he's rambled for three or four minutes and hasn't really ever answered the question. So I think one of the things you can take away from that as far as from a witness perspective is you know, we, short, concise responses are that are responsive to the question are a lot better than rambling long answers. And I know he was trying to get in a story and, and weave a theme, but I think ended up once again, getting lost in his long rambling answers, at least from me, my perspective on the outside watching, I just, it was brutal. I think he'd ask a question and then you wouldn't get around to it. So I think at least like you said, looking at, at it from a, a normal trial, those would not be the way you would want your witnesses to answer. So I think what, but one good thing he did do though, is when we're talking about how Amber Heard had her amygdala hijack, Johnny was more calm, cool, and collected in his responses. Now he had his snarky moments and he had his couple moments, but they were few and far between. And it was like I said, going back, it was almost that people thought it was funny when he did it. So once again, you wouldn't want your witnesses to do that, but in his case, you know, it, it helped. But once again, I think from a demeanor standpoint, he was more even keel the whole time, which probably helped to endear him a little bit more where he was already at with the jury. Hmm. And I think one other thing that he did that I liked and that we talk about is he took a little bit of a space to pause before he actually gave a response. You know, we talk about doing that in depositions and at trial. And I know sometimes people get uncomfortable having their witnesses take a big long pause before they respond because jurors will think they're making it up 
And I say, yes, there's some truth to that. But what happens is if you're consistent every time, if you're slow and methodical every time you answer the question, both on direct and cross, jurors aren't going to think anything of it. It's when you're getting questions from your own attorney and all of a sudden you're firing off responses. And then all of a sudden, and then on cross-examination, they come up and now your demeanor completely changes and you're really slow in your answers. That's obviously where jurors are smart enough to see the difference between both of those styles. I think one thing Johnny did was he stayed pretty consistent, whether it was cross-exam and direct examination, which I thought, like you said, helped him keep his credibility and didn't make that pause, uh, didn't make it seem strange because really that pause is nice, which is likely why he was able to A, keep his, you know, keep, keep his cool, but B, what it does is it allows you to be able to hear the question and digest the question that's being asked by the, per, you know, by the attorney before giving your response, right? If you just respond quickly, that you're not really having enough time because as jurors, they're hearing it for the first time, right? I mean, you know the topic and you know the information, but jurors are hearing it for the first time. So that's why you need to be slow and methodical, you know, which is what I thought Johnny Depp did pretty well too. And I'm not sure, like I said, once again, what your thoughts were on, on any of that really from just a critical communication standpoint or a communication standpoint about what your thoughts were on how he was responding either. Well, I, mean, I think you see from the way that his clips were replayed that a lot of his fan base, a lot of his supporters would have seen the way he conducted himself as consistent with uh, how they perceive him already, right? So, and he had some room there because, you know, he could be a, uh, you know, he's, a, uh, he's someone who's been around for a long time and people have seen him in various roles, et cetera. And so, you know, he had some range there to, to play with because, um, uh, because of people's familiarity with him and the reasons why they, you know, are his, are his fans. And so I guess I would say that I didn't see anything that was, would be inconsistent with that in the way that he, the way that he testified and the way that he presented himself. And it was, so it allowed, it allowed people to kind of continue uh, their perceptions of him uh, because of the way that he did present himself. So it, it uh, you know, it appeared to work in, in all the various social media forums because those snippets, those clips, uh, none of, I, I don't recall a, a one that was, you know, particularly critical of him. Yeah. You know, and I think kind of stepping away from the trial in and of itself, and I want to talk more about what your thoughts are really on kind of the aftermath of it. Cause I know, like I said, you and I had talked before about it. And I think your kind of thoughts as far as how each side is kind of taking the verdict and running with it as far as positioning themselves uh, is going to be a little bit different, right? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because there were, you know, there was the legal case, and uh, but really the backdrop of the legal case, given both of their claims, was impact on their respective careers, right? So um, a lot of, you know, I would say this: a lot of what needed to be done in terms of the litigation communications during the trial was to protect their reputations and to, uh, as best as possible, given the subject matter, right? Given the testimony. Um, but to insulate them as best as possible so that they, you know, so that they could uh, go back to their careers, right? So, and so, you know, you see from Johnny that it was, you know, the way that he, uh, he and his team come out of his vindication and, uh, you know, he wrote a very personal post to his uh, fan base about what this meant for him and his life moving forward, his career moving forward. And, you uh, and then uh, there was a standard, you know, statement from there was a statement from uh, Amber, Amber and her team. So, uh, but uh, you know, there was a bit of a, uh, of a, you know, there was things that were uh, happening to keep him in the news that, you know, and show some forward momentum. You know, he's going to do an he was performing. He was going to do an album. You know, these kinds of things. Uh, so that shows some positive momentum coming out of it. It shows action shows he's doing things. Uh, you see just in the past few days, Amber is being more, uh, she's coming out, uh, she's doing some high profile interviews. I think she's on with Savannah Guthrie, but she, um, you know, she has to uh, kind of reboot the narrative, uh, which, is, which is what she's going about doing. Uh, so, you know, I think that would, what I would say, it applies to both of them, but I think he's the one who is a higher profile uh, to begin with and higher profile now, especially since they've taken somewhat of a victory lap 
is that he's going to have to be careful with his conduct because anything that supports some of the more negative testimony about him also will be highlighted now if he if he if he doesn't uh, you know kind of stick to a more you know, I would say carefully constructed public persona. Um, so, uh, it's, you know, you can look at this verdict and its impact on your life and what it means for your career, but know that people are still watching. I think, you know, and I've, I've seen some corollaries between him and uh, Robert Downey Jr. I mean, if you remember, I think it was the 80s and 90s where he had had some problems and now he had his resurgence with Iron Man and a lot of the other stuff. Now everybody loves him. But to your point, he's kind of, stayed to straight and narrow and ha hasn't really had a lot of those drug and alcohol problems at least pop up in in the press like he had back then i think it goes back to your point i think that you're making as well right is kind of how if if he stays the straight and narrow it's, it it kind of goes away and then he has his resurgence and everybody loves johnny depp again and all the stuff bad stuff goes away but if he has a has a slip up or he has something that then will give support to that initial narrative i think then he probably have some problems right yeah, I mean, it's very possible. And so it is also unclear. I've read some articles, you know, speculating about their careers and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's what some of the experts have said, the entertainment experts have said is that there's still the issues that were brought up in trial about, you know, how he is, you know, in uh, what he does in terms of, you know, showing up on time and things like that. And so, you know, it's those behaviors that people are going to be thinking about and looking at. So I don't, you know, it's, it's it's a more complicated thing about whether or not a studio is going to make a decision on either one of them uh, in terms of you know large budget uh, productions that they may be part of because you won't know until people vote with their feet right will they go will they you, there's ways to research and there's ways to predict uh, you know certainly you, uh, you get a sense coming out of this trial of some you know resurgence for him but. Uh, it's just too early to say where it will go, uh, according to what the experts that I've read have said, because that's certainly not my area, but, you know, it's, from what you read, there's, you know, it's, it's yet to be determined. Yeah, and I think one of the other things I'm curious to get your thoughts on is I know Johnny wasn't there when the, the verdict was read and Amber was, and there were some comments made about his lack of appearance kind of showing how he felt about it and how, how serious he was taking it and Amber's side saying the fact that she was there was showing how important it was. You know, what did you think about that as far as positioning, messaging, and whether or not you think he should have been there or shouldn't have been there? Well, I mean, I thought it was interesting because, you know, his counter message was, I'm busy, I'm working. And so it, it probably avoided a, a comfortable, um, a scene where, you know, media may have been trying to set up a conflict between them, uh, you know. Uh, so, you know, to me, I don't think it mattered. The, the, the verdict was the verdict. I don't think people, it was too late for people to think he wasn't taking it seriously uh, because the verdict had already been rendered. And so, you know, to me, if, if, you're, if you're thinking about the rest of my life, the rest of my career, it's not necessarily a bad message to say, I can't be there. I'm I'm working. He was, it was, it was, you know, the message to both of them from various uh, celebrities, as I recall, in their posts was, I hope everyone, I hope both can get on with their lives. And so it was him saying, I'm getting on with my life, perhaps. I mean, you know, that's one interpretation of it that isn't so bad. So, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, uh, I don't know, I, to me, that was, it was a kind of a, a non-issue. Yeah. I'll wrap up, but I do have another question too, is, uh, you know, as far as, like you said, from a critical communication standpoint is, you know, case in, in over in London turned out a little bit different than it did over here, obviously different legal systems, a lot of different perceptions in the way that the things are run, obviously with the jury system and all that. I mean, do you think that a lot of this stuff that we've been talking about today probably played into some of that decision-making that, that jurors had as far as, you know, I mean, I, I can't imagine that even though it's to their best of the ability, kind of like Amber had mentioned in her in her in her um, interview, is that she found it hard to believe that the jury wouldn't have actually seen this, or the jury wouldn't have actually, you know, somehow heard or got a sense for kind of what people are coming from, you know, whether or not that had any influence. You know, I, I just got kind of kind of curious what your thoughts are about that from a just a like I said, crit com perspective. Well, 
Yeah, well, as we both know, it's not supposed to, right? Right. But um, people are people, and I don't know. I don't know. You know, I, I wouldn't speculate about about what they saw or didn't see or how it influenced them. I think that the the broader issue was would be the um, reputations and the perceptions of those two people coming out of this trial and how that was managed. I think that um, you know, just in just in general, it might have been better. Uh, certainly for her side, if the case had not been broadcast, then you are stuck, then you are reliant on journalists attending and reporting and sketches and things like that. I think when you have something that is so emotional and emotive, and when you have the kind of testimony and the kind of stories that you heard uh, sensationalized, it's just the perfect kind of fodder for social media. Two celebrities, um, it kind of, you know, I, I wonder if you did a you know, survey today or you went out on the street and asked people what was the central you know, um, legal issue in this case, they, could they tell you? <laughs> right, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, so if there was, if it wasn't broadcast, there, there, there would have been uh, perhaps a little more attention to that and not so much the sensational uh, aspects of it. I don't, it's just, uh, it just seems to me that, you know, for if people are looking for justice, um, if it's gonna be tried uh, concurrently in the court of public opinion and this highly visible way, then you have to be really sharp and you have to have a really good plan and you have to have some really good experts to publicly stand by you and rebut. And you have to, as we said, uh, your point has to stand for something much bigger so that you can rally um, larger groups of more influential supporters. These are the things that have to be thought of, planned, and done in a litiga litigation communication strategy in advance. And that's, you know, that's the heart of what you know, we do on the critical communication communication side, your side, and the things that you talk about in terms of witness preparation, et cetera, and the messaging that's used, et cetera. Again, that's equally critical because it's going to be parsed and it's going to be played. You know, and I and like I said, we'll we'll wrap up with this last question because you know, you've worked on some some big pretty big cases in in your day and we don't have to talk about them but i guess the point being i'm saying is you've been involved i mean it doesn't have to be a movie star versus movie star case right i mean these these things are important for large corporations small corporations individuals a lot of things where the messaging becomes important right it's not just one that's going to be so you know widespread like this but there is ripple effects that can be had right with with other companies it through social media and Twitter and all these other aspects, right? Yeah, yes. Well, see, I think it's a good case for uh, uh, companies and others to study because it shows how a narrative can be kind of how one how one side can take the narrative forward, <clears throat> right? So uh, and own it, and how <clears throat> unless you're not unless you're prepared, you know, you can be the one who, who kind of loses uh, from the from the gate. It's hard to get it back. It's the same thing in a crisis. If you're not uh, quick to respond with how you're going to fix something and make sure it never happens again, you're likely to lose the narrative, right? If you play victim, if you play not my fault, if you play, um, you know, we're kind of studying this, then you leave way too much space for other people to make judgments and also to say, I'm going, if you're not going to give us justice, then I'm going to get it, right? So that's crisis aspect of it. The litigation communications aspect of it is you have a major case and there's any uh, kind of anything at stake. It's, and what is always at stake if you're the company is your company's reputation. And it also could be your valuation, you know, if you're publicly traded, how investors feel about you. So it doesn't have to be celebrities. You just have to have, uh, if you are a high profile company or if you have a high profile issue, uh, people are going to pay attention to the litigation because they're looking for, you know, precedent. They're looking for good guys and bad guys. They're looking for a compelling story to tell, right? And so what do stories all have? They have that part about who's the good guy, who's the bad guy. What are the bad things that happen, you know? You need to have a strategy around that. And so if you have any kind of litigation, something that needs to be thought of because you don't want to you don't want to let someone else write your narrative. You want to write it yourself. Yeah, I think that's a that's a perfect way to end. I think that's a that's a sums up kind of what your job does and, and sums up 
what kind of happened in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial. So, John, great conversation. I wish we had more time to talk. Uh, I love picking your brain when we talk about critical communication stuff. So, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for sharing your thoughts on this. Thank you, Steve. So, Appreciate it. Always good being here. Yeah. So, come back. We'll have you come back again and talk about uh, some other concepts and cases soon. But this has been another edition of the Litigation Psychology Podcast brought to you by Courtroom Sciences. Take care.